Until recently, I intuitively believed that when I paid my taxes to the Commonwealth Government of Australia, that the government would then aggregate that money into one big account at the Australian Tax Office. And then from that taxation account, they would allocate that money as spending to procure government purchases like roads and schools and hospitals. As they say, taxes purchase civilization. And to some extent, I imagined that if I paid my taxes in cash, that is using Australian dollar denominated banknotes, if I paid my taxes in cash, that there must be some vehicles, government run um, trucks driving around the country, picking up those uh, tax dollars from where we paid them and then driving them to some unknown location in Canberra, some Fort Knox equivalent, where they would then deposit that, uh, that tax money ready to be spent on public sector purchases. Sometimes they would use the tax money on things that I liked and wanted, like um, a, a shiny new train network, and other times they would use the, the money on things I could see were useful, like free universal education, even though I'm no longer at university, I could see the use for that. And sometimes they would spend that tax money on things that I downright w opposed, like a, a $50 billion new set of submarines. But I believed that this magical spot must exist somewhere in Canberra, some tin shed underground vault in Canberra, where they would take all of the tax money, aggregate it, and then get ready to spend it on the public purpose. Now, a minute or two on Wikipedia can clear up some of those erroneous ideas. For instance, all of the coins that we use, the Australian dollar coins, they come from the Royal Mint in Canberra, and that's operated by the Department of Treasury. All of the banknotes that we use, those come from Note Printing Australia, which is in Melbourne, and that is a, a, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Reserve Bank of Australia. And the Reserve Bank of Australia is headquartered in Sydney. When I was at university, I would receive Centrelink payments, OS study payments, they call it, and that didn't arrive in hard currency. There were no banknotes or coins. That money appeared digitally in my account. So for all intents and purposes, that money was digital dollars. It existed only on a screen until I withdrew that as Australian dollar banknotes from an ATM or a retail outlet. So those digital dollars didn't come from Note Printing Australia in Melbourne, nor did they come in the form of coins from Canberra. They came from keystrokes at the Reserve Bank of Australia, which is headquartered in Martin Place in Sydney. So if the money's coming from all of these different areas, where then do they keep the tax dollars? After I pay my taxes, where do they keep them? Do they keep the tax dollars in Melbourne? Do they keep them in Sydney? Do they keep them in Canberra? Is there a tin shed, some magical Fort Knox somewhere, full of Australian gold? Are there armoured cars that drive around the, the take of tax collection uh, and then are deposited somewhere? Or maybe it's all just too complex and too complicated for little old me to understand. Well, I thought so. And then I started learning about modern monetary theory. Hello. My name's Gideon. This is my two cents adjusted for inflation, and today marks the midway point in our discussion about MMT. MMT shows that a government which is the monopoly issuer of its own currency cannot become insolvent with respect to liabilities, with respect to obligations denominated in its own currency. That is to say that a government which issues a fiat currency can never go broke. The seminal authors of modern monetary theory explain that a government budget is not comparable with a household budget, and that whilst federal taxes drive currency, they drive our use of the currency, they do not actually contribute to government spending. In fact, government deficit spending must necessarily happen before a government can demand its citizens to pay some of that government-issued currency back in the form of taxes. For example, all Australian dollars are issued by the government of Australia via the Reserve Bank. The Reserve Bank of Australia is Australia's central bank. Any Australian dollar that was not originally issued by the Australian government is counterfeit. Therefore, to pay taxes in Australian dollars, one must use dollars that originated from the government sector. The government necessarily had to deficit spend those dollars first 
so that you could pay taxes in that currency. If you find in your possession an Australian dollar that was issued by someone in China, then it's counterfeit. If you have in your possession an Australian dollar that was issued by your neighbour in his basement, it's counterfeit. The only legitimate Australian dollars are those which were issued by the Reserve Bank of Australia under the auspice of the Australian government. The Reserve Bank of Australia was initiated in 1959 by an Act of Parliament and it can only be changed or amended by an Act of Parliament. It is the central authority that creates currency and it, it makes us use the currency. So this notion in mainstream orthodox economics that Robinson Crusoe and Friday were haggling on a desert island and they created barter and then they used barter until it became inefficient and it was more difficult to divide up seashells or, or bits of cow than it was to divide up money. It says that money originated in the private sector, that it sprung out of a barter economy. This private markets bartering and self-interest generated money story is not backed up by archaeological or anthropological evidence. Increasingly, it looks like it is simply a convenient textbook myth. Some societies have had or currently use economies that don't revolve around money, but instead they rely on trade and truck and barter, gift giving or subsistence self-sufficiency. You might be able to think of some hunter-gatherer societies that operate like this. It is government authority that drives us to use currency. In modern societies where we do use money, and when we say modern societies we mean well, economies have been using money for certainly more than four or five thousand years. Those are the, the modern monetary societies, and they require the use of money via a central government. And so this is sometimes called the state theory of money, and it suggests that taxes, fees and fines that are issued by the government are what compel the population to use that currency of issue. Warren Mosler says, why do we have taxes? Well, to create unemployment, of course. The purpose of taxes, he says, is to create unemployment. What is unemployment? Unemployment is people who are looking for work who can't find it. And it's not just about any work. There's plenty of work to be done all the time. But it's about paid work. Hunter-gatherer societies that don't use money have always had jobs to get on with, things to do, but they're not paid work. They're not paid jobs. And so there was no unemployment in societies and economies that existed before money. And in non-monetary economies, there is no unemployment. Unemployment occurs after an economy becomes monetized. And this is fascinating because in modern money economies, we, we are told that there's a natural rate of unemployment. It's called the Nehru. They refer to this thing as the Nehru. Nobody knows what it is. Personally, I think it's bogus, but they'll say things like, we believe that between 5 and 15% of a population should naturally be unemployed. And to me, this is fascinating because here I have a flock of chickens, 10 chickens, and there is no natural rate of unemployment among chickens. All 10 chickens are out there right now, pecking away, doing their jobs, getting on with the day. There's not one of the 10 chickens that just permanently sits idle. Every time I see 10 cows, there's not a natural rate of unemployment in cows. If you see 10 cows in a field eating grass and chewing their cud, you'll never see one that is permanently without productive work to do. So why, if there is naturally full employment of cows and chickens and goats and sheep, why should there for some reason be a natural rate of unemployment among humans? Indeed, back in 1929, John Maynard Keynes wrote, the conservative belief that there is some law of nature which prevents men from being employed, that it is rash to employ men, and that it is financially sound to maintain a tenth of the population in idleness for an indefinite period, is crazily improbable. The sort of thing which no man could believe who had not had his head fuddled with nonsense for years and years. The purpose of taxes is to create people who are looking for paid work. On the African continent throughout the 19th century, colonists would impose fees, fines and taxes payable only in their currency of issue. And this would draw labour to them from the private sector. One example is the hut tax. A colonial government would try to encourage labour to work on their plantations. I say, would you mind awfully coming and working on my plantation? I'll pay you this shiny coin. Well, the local population wouldn't budge. They had no need for that currency. They operated without 
the British pound or the French franc. For tens of thousands of years, they'd been living quite happily without need of these shiny metal coins or, or paper notes. In fact, to Indigenous peoples who operate in a subsistence hunter-gatherer society with a gift-giving or trade-based economy, these foreign currencies were of zero value. The people wouldn't work on the plantation for that currency of issue until there was a tax. So the colonists would impose a tax and they would say that unless you pay at the end of the year for every hut that each family owns a certain amount, you will be imprisoned, your hut will be burnt down, you'll be tortured, there will be big problems. And so sure enough, the indigenous populations were compelled, they were coerced, they were forced to work for the colonisers in order to gain their currency of issue so that they could pay their tax. You can see from the hut tax example that the British authority did not need to wait until the local villagers paid them some British pounds before the British government could spend buying ships and soldiers and sailors and, and building buildings. In fact, it's obvious that before the British got to Africa, there were no British pounds in Africa with which the African population could pay a tax in British pounds. The British authority had to spend British pounds first before they could take them back in taxes. And the reason that they taxed the locals was not so that they could get some British pounds off them. It was to coerce them to work for the British authority. It was to coerce them to move their labour and real goods and services from the private domain amongst each other to move them to the public domain, the authority. So the next time that you hear somebody saying, well, I don't want my taxpayer dollars going to pay for this and that. Some people, left-wing people say, I don't want my taxpayer dollars paying for war. Right-wing people say, I don't want my taxpayer dollars paying for abortions or, or drug rehabilitation. You can remind them that their taxpayer dollars are not paying for anything. Economies that don't use money do not experience a rate of unemployment. It is only when a government authority begins to tax that citizens are required to move their labour from the private to the public sector. So, why does the government tax? They do it to create unemployment. The government does, does it to provision itself, to move real goods and services, real resources from the private sector to the public sector. If the, if the government wants labour, it wants soldiers, it wants stone from quarries and timber milled from forests, it wants doctors for its hospitals. How does it get that? It does it by imposing a tax in something that the people don't have and that only it can issue, and then it asks for that back in order to convince you to work for them. Now, in England at one time, they moved um, real goods and services from the private to the public sector in a kind of more brutal way. They would hit you on the head or you'd be um, drinking a beer and at the bottom of the beer you'd see the king's coin and then you'd have taken the king's shilling and off you'd go to the army. That was one way of provisioning people for public service. Another way is to simply enslave people by capturing a population and forcing them to work for you. A more civilised way is to create a tax in something that nobody has and then offering jobs that pay that thing so that people can obtain it in order to pay their taxes. So when this government, when a, or any government wants to move real goods and services from the public, from the private to the public domain, they first want to provision themselves. So they do it with a tax that creates unemployment. And then the point of spending is when people move from the private to the public sector, spending the otherwise worthless currency. Thank you so much for listening. My name's Gideon Cordova. This has been My Two Cents Adjusted for Inflation. I'll catch you next time.